Steve Barron, welcome. First of all, I want to thank you for your enormous um, contribution to pop culture, particularly as someone who worked for MTV, it's it's been absolutely enormous. And I glad, you know, I really think for all of us, you've made um, uh, such a wonderful contribution. So thank you for that. I want to start off with your childhood because you're the son of um, Zelda Baron, your mother, who was a uh, director, um, script continuity person as well, and script advisor. And your father, um, Tom, no, sorry, Ray, was an actor. Ron. So Ron, Ron was it? Ah, oh, see, I've got one yeah. up. Ron and Tom yeah. and Ray, yeah. Okay, Ron was yeah. an actor. And I just wondered, what was the conversation around <laughs> the table when you were very young? What Was it about film and acting, or was it just normal stuff? When I was very young, I, I wanted it to be about football. Uh, so that was the kind of conversation I wanted to have for many years uh and uh at the yeah my my mother was often my mum and dad were often away actually um making films they would go you know 14 weeks in mexico or in canada or whatever when we were me and my sister my older sister siobhan were, when we were quite young and uh, so we had sort of a you know, uh, I, uh, the, the parents were, were missing because they had to, and there was no other way of doing it uh, for, for some of it. But, uh, you know, obviously uh, a, a fair amount of it, we, uh, especially with my mother, my relationship with my mother was really close um, because my mum and dad split up when we were about 12 and, and, uh, uh, and I lived with my mum and uh, she was, Big inspiration. She was in the film business. I didn't know what to do. I, I didn't make it as a footballer. So I didn't know what to do. And I got interested in cameras. That's where it all came from. When you were at school, you you were, I don't know if this is the right word, but it does seem from what your uh, uh, headmaster said that you will never get anywhere, that you're a bit of a failure at school. And school system obviously failed you. What do you think was wrong with the school system back then? Because we're a similar age. And I think that when, when I went to school, it was really focused not on creativity. It was focused on, you know, really sort of just learning things, which, which wasn't a real creative aspect. And creativity for me came much later. But for you, I just wondered if, if that was in a way something that you could rebel against at that time, because it didn't fit you in any way. Yeah, I I didn't. Uh, I wasn't. I went to a, a school I really didn't like. Um, actually, to a grammar school, which was the strictest schools at the time, and uh, the the rules and uh, and the way of teaching were all about discipline and about uh, you know things that weren't in anywhere inspiring logarithms and things you were going to learn that, that that you had to learn through repetition and until it was stuck in your head and what point, you know, I didn't see the point to anything. And uh, there was really not encouraged to do much else, but I, I got thrown out of that school, maybe about 13, 14, luckily. And I've spent the last year or so at another school where they were a bit more open, a bit more, um, well, you know, what, what do you want to do? And they gave me a, 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 a bit of super eight film. And I actually went and made a, made a little film. It was the only, thing I was inspired to uh, to pass the exam or in in art that was under the art um, banner and uh, so it was uh, it, yeah it was a real uh, not not enjoyable relationship with 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 school and learning I had an aversion to being told what to do as well I think which didn't help what was this super eight film what did you make uh, it was called glass and I just hung some bottles uh in the, in the window we were living in a flat on the third floor and uh hung hung some different colored bottles um and then put it to uh, a kind of japanese soundtrack and it had uh some great flares in it i remember that just like because we were shooting into direct sunlight but through the bottles how did you and, get from that to get your first job which was a, what's it called a clapper something or other Clapper loader. A, a clapper loader, yeah, which is a camera assistant, basically, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah, it's like the bottom of the rung of the camera system. So you're loading the film in the camera and you're in the magazines, you go into the camera and uh, you're putting the clapperboard on. Um, I got I got there via uh, a job, my first job, which was in Cricklewood. I was in living in Kilburn we were, and down the road in Cricklewood was a big camera hire firm that uh, rented all the cameras to all the big movies. And they were looking for a T-boy for like a year. They couldn't, because they didn't want to pay much. They wanted to pay 12 quid a week. They were looking for a T-boy and I, I went for the job and got, and, you know, got it. And, uh, and that gave me uh, kind of introductions to a lot of, to meeting a lot of film crew. Uh, and, uh, you know, different crews would come in through, and I would also be my job to clean off the clapperboards. And so I'd be tearing off the tape, which had the dates of, uh, you know, like a film like Cabaret or, um, uh, some of those early doc, um, Sherlock Holmes films and everything. And uh, they, they, these boxes would come in from the set of those films. And I'd been around a few sets because my mum and dad were in the business. But from a work point of view, I'd never really thought about it this way. And it got quite interesting as, as my job was really make the tea and clean, it, clean a few lenses and that sort of thing. I learned about the lenses. I was curious about them. I learned about the cameras. I learned about loading the film. So after about a year and a half, two years at this firm, I was like, then 17, I, uh, it, the few, a few big crews came in and they were like, well, what are you doing here? Do you want to do something else? And uh, and they were basically inviting me onto their crews for A Bridge Too Far and Superman. It was Peter McDonald and Jeff Unsworth and they were the ace crew and they weren't, they had just, their clapper load had been upgraded to focus puller, so they had a vacancy and they took me on to these enormous productions at a very young age. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of got thrown in the deep end and, and thankfully, and uh, just uh, just really learnt, learnt over those years um, about the craft. It sounds like from your book that Peter McDonald was a bit of a mentor to you. What, what did you learn from him that specifically really has helped you in your professional career? Um, from Peter, it was really self-discipline more than anything, because I suppose I, I was lacking a bit of a father figure at the time as well. My dad, mum and dad had split up and we weren't, uh, you know, I didn't see much of him. And, and I was also a bit rebellious. And uh, so I was a bit of a bit of a skinhead and, uh, you know, like kind of looking for, you know, looking for trouble. And, and then I was working and earning money to live. And, um, and Peter, Peter at that age, about 18, took me on to... Uh, uh, took me onto the, these films, and and you know I'd, I'd carry on with my slightly wayward behaviour, going out on the town, uh, as all the camera crew would, you know, the, or the ones that were more susceptible to that would do. And you're away for eight months in another country, and you go out, and you know the hooligan part of me kind of came out a number of times, but whenever it did, he gave me this kind of discipline he'd get me on the crane in a very complicated shot give me 17 camera moves to, to sizes on the zoom to hit at certain points in the dialogue between Robert Redford and uh, you know James Kahn and then he would put me on a shot on Superman he'd put me on a shot when they burst into the White House and say right you you're on that lens you tell me whether you like it or not and we're going to have three explosions and, and you know it's completely taught you responsibility i suppose and uh he was amazing operator as well he had um an incredible um knack of uh of, of with that with the wheels which were the left and right and the up and down on the other hand and uh he was just so skillful some of his shots he'd invent most of it them were his richard attenborough and bridge too far let him really you know, come up with what the angles were going to be and how the shot was going to develop. And uh, he would uh, he would develop it with a whole, either a crane or a dance floor of moves. And he would rely on the grip and the focus puller and the clapper loader to, to bring all those moves together. And they, they were, you know, and I, I, you know, I've fucked up a number of times, obviously, um, in various ways. But it, I learned, I never have learned so much in the space of a few years um, from such a great professional as Peter. Did you also learn about the relationship between the crew members? So, you know, there you have the, the 
director of photography or the, the camera person, and then you have the director communicating with each other. So did you actually sort of glean information about how the whole team operates, do you think, as well? Yeah, I did I did with the crew. I, I didn't pay much attention. I didn't see uh, what I was interested in was with, with the crew and the way and the grips and the and up to the the uh, camera operator and because that's as far as I could see. I could see myself becoming a focus puller in maybe 10, 15 years and then an operator another 10 years and then and then I might be a DP, but I wasn't sure about that because I didn't know exactly what their their skill set was, even though I saw how they operated with the with the gaffer and the lighting and everything. I didn't know really a lot about their skill set. I wasn't. I was more into the lenses and the uh, and the workings and uh, and those and and all the other crew, obviously. And but um, I didn't look at that, and I didn't look really at what the director, how the director's process uh, formed itself, and differently, and obviously different characters. Richard Attenborough was somebody who would very much talk to the actors and, and ignore the camera. And I worked with Ridley Scott on his first film, and he was somebody who would completely be stuck to the camera and be painting the images beautifully, but but leaving the actors kind of a bit, uh, uh, you know, cut and dry, <laughs> high and dry, I should say, um, to figure out their characters themselves. Um, so, yeah, it's it was... It was uh, Something I wished I'd have paid more attention to. I worked with three amazing directors, Dick Donner, Richard Attenborough, um, Ridley Scott, in the space of two years on big productions. And if I'd have known I would have become a director, which I never, at this point, I had no ambitions for it or no real thinking that I could, you know, I would make that role or know, know what that role really was. And so, because I didn't go to film school, I, di I, didn't, I didn't know anything about the storytelling aspect of it. You also worked with David Putnam on a, on a documentary in Canterbury Cathedral, and uh, you know you talked about the fact that, that you know you would you were a, I wouldn't say a troublemaker, but you got into a bit of trouble, and at that point you managed to inadvertently call Prince Charles an idiot, <laughs> which is a great story in your book. So what exactly <laughs> happened? Um, I actually, uh, yeah, I. I got called, I'd, I'd been out, I think I was, I must have been 17 at the time, and I was still kind of hanging out with my mates and going going out clubbing in London down the Wag Club or whatever, and uh, having a bit of a time. And then they called up and said, oh, we need a couple of for a two-week job. You've got to be in Canterbury Cathedral, and you've got to wear a tie, which so I associated straight away with my school, as I hadn't touched a tie since I got out of school at 15. And um, I didn't even remember how to tie a tie. And they said, you've got to wear a tie, you've got to wear a jacket, and you have to speak like this to the Prince Charles. You have to say, you can't say you're Charles, and you can't say you're Prince Charles. You've got to say, I can't even remember what it was. There's something like your Royal Highness. Um, can we, you know, and, and don't say it if you don't have to. And so um, I, was, uh, I was on the set feeling a bit kind of anarchic or like something that day. And uh, with with Charles and we were doing a number of takes around this documentary around the, the cathedral and just really about what uh, what the stained glass windows all meant and and we were in, in front of the Thomas a Beckett stained glass window I remember and we were doing a tracking slow moving shot towards Charles where he would um, he would read from the autocue the words were on the camera in front of him for about three minutes and then. Uh, finished and we did, we had done about five takes and he'd not got really past the first minute of the take and uh, um, and I don't know you know I, I, I just kind of went up you know in front of him with the clapper board for the next take and I, instead it was 26 take six but for some reason out of my mouth came 26 take twit and I clapped it and I had that horrible moment I was like kind of I did I say, I can't have said that, I was, you know, I didn't, yeah, I might have been thinking it, but I, I kind of, kind of, I kind of said it out loud. So I crouched down by, by the camera and it was this horrible silence. I thought, oh my God, I did, no one's saying a word. And then the director said, action. And uh, we did the track in. And this time he made it through the whole three minutes and he got, got to the end of it. And the director said, thank you, we got that. And after each setup, the Prince Charles was whisked off to the crypt because he was under security at the time. 
and uh, he was whisked, whisked off and the crew just burst into laughter and and the sound man replayed the me saying 26 day twit uh, echoing all around canterbury cathedral they were laughing their heads off. i was extremely embarrassed because i thought uh, you know i didn't mean that it was if it was my joke <laughs> it would have been okay but um i couldn't claim it really and uh so we did that and then when he came back out he was definitely i mean i saw him out the corner of my eye and he was looking at me like, you know, beheading. I don't know what he was thinking, but something, uh, some sort of punishment or some, whether he should even step in and do something. And uh, anyway, it was all left. Okay. And David Putnam came by the set the following day and said, Baron, over here, you know, he summed me over. He said, look, um, all very well. Uh, very funny. Everyone thought that was very funny. I've just watched the rushes though. And it's completely unusable because the cameraman and their focus puller have both got their hands on the camera, on the track in, and they're just holding their laughter in that the whole camera's trembling and shaking. And it's not usable. So I hope you're happy. I was like, I, you know, it's like, uh, anyway, so I got in trouble. I frequently got in trouble. How did you make the move from those working on those uh early films as a sort of camera assistant to actually starting your own production company and, and making videos? Uh, I think it was, it was really through the bit of nightlife, you know, like, like going to, going to Water Street and, uh, and hanging out uh, with friends that were, some of which, which were in bands, were in, you know, we didn't really have a crossover between film and music and except socially. And uh, so I, you know, I met a few people and uh, I was, by this point, 18, 19, I was on Superman. I was uh, on it for nine, 10 months in Pinewood and in uh, Shepparton. And, you know, I was itching, I suppose, to, to, to be a bit more entrepreneurial with what I was doing. And um, uh, I met this guy and he said, uh, he said, I'm a, I'm a road manager of a band. you you work in film and I, I said yeah I'm a clapper loader in Superman and he didn't nobody knew what a clapper loader was nobody knew really what a director was at that point there was no you know there's no real crossover at all between the two industries and uh, he he said well uh, could you get a camera and film my band and uh, I was like yeah yeah he said well I'll get some money from the record company come and film the band and it was a it was a band called Bartley James Harvest and uh they he actually wanted a documentary following them and their music around Germany. So I asked Peter McDonald, we were just finishing on Super. I said, Do you want to come with me? They've given me a bit of money to do. They give me like six grand. I didn't even know how to add up. I didn't even know what the editing would cost. I'd never done that. And all I knew was the camera, which I could get almost for nothing, and uh, a little crew. And I got I got my dad on sound, and the five of us went off uh, to follow. Um, to follow this band around and uh, for as a promotional film. And actually, I'd done very well for the few years before, uh, earning a bit of money, and uh, I'd put it onto a house, which I then lost on this production because I had no idea what, what it would all cost. And, uh, but it did lead and open the doors to, right, well, let's, um, let's form a company and see whether we can get some other groups to uh, get involved. I mean, it's a very sort of, well, for me, it sounds like a very um, story of its era um, because the early 80s was so experimental and, the, you know, particularly in, the, in music, it had, uh, because of technology and everything, people were making music in their bedrooms and then comes this upsurge of bands um, in New Wave and, and all that area. And it felt, it feels like when I read your story, it's very much of the era that it's a story that may not, probably couldn't happen today um in a way because you sort of these opportunities came to you i mean obviously you're you're making the moves but in a sense they came to you but they're not opportunities that maybe would be given today because people seem to look for like what have they really done in the past what what qualities can they bring to something whereas you got these offers and then you made something of them do you think yeah. that's sort of a, a, a true perspective of what, what it was back then? I, th I think it is, yeah. There was a much smaller quantity of people who could force their way into this world because uh, they, because either, like Julian Temple, they went to film school or, or like me, they kind of grew up on 
in the camera, on the crew, on the set. Um, whereas people just coming there with a, you know, from an art background or whatever, it'd be really hard for them to to get in to that first step. Where actually, I think it's a lot easier now in a lot of ways, even though the market's completely flooded and there's tons of people who are in the similar position where they can access enough uh, data to make a film of, of three minutes, five minutes, seven minutes, almost anyone can, well, any, anyone can do it because everyone who's got a mobile phone could do it. So, and uh, but, but what it needs to be now, what it needed to be then was good. What it needs to be now is amazing. Otherwise it's, it's a waste of time. You don't, you're not going to get something else from it. You're not going to get, a bigger budget or whatever, unless it's absolutely amazing. It has to really stand out, it has to break through the noise that now is is there. Uh, so it's harder, I think, in that way. It's so harder, even though it's easier to actually access the material, it's harder to, to, to break through and make a name for yourself. I mean, you were based in London, and you still are, I think, at that, that, but at that point you were in London, and MTV had started in 1980, um, or was it 1980 in America, 1981, I think, in America. Yeah. And um, you wouldn't have really necessarily known at the start what the impact of a pop video could be. And I just wondered whether the, even that the artists knew the impact of a pop video, because in a way that they present their image in this three minutes, and it's because it's on a rotation and you see it hundreds of times, you you take that image for the person eventually. So Madonna, you know, has this sexualized image, and that was in the early days very much so. Um, and you know, uh, Michael Jackson, as you mentioned when you when you did Billie Jean, in this sort of magical image of him was very important to 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 his development. Do you think you were aware back then of the impact of the pop video and the pop stars were aware? Or was it just something that sort of came later? I think it, it definitely came after starting in the promotional film world of, of uh, large record companies, CBS and Warners and everything, because their attitude was, we'll take a promotional film, we'll use it in Holland and Germany and try and use it in a few other places. But it's those guys that, that we want to, the international end of, of selling these records, these guys want you to do some television and we're going to have to make a film of that. And uh, so they, they treat it very much like it's, uh, we've got to do it. It doesn't really have a massive impact, but it's in, an important piece in us in the jigsaw, a smaller piece in the jigsaw. Then along came MTV and uh, that made it completely different because suddenly people were watching a 24 hour channel that was only music videos and 24 hours and a biggish audience, growing audience. Uh, and uh, it, so then it was like, wait a minute, there, there's a whole other world for these, uh, for these videos. And there's a whole lot of interest in them as videos, as well as the artists and the, and the music. And uh, that all kind of, you know, grew through through MTV appearing really, and uh, changed changed attitudes from the record companies. Well, some record companies, some record companies stayed with the attitude that oh God, we got to do it because now we're going to put it in there. We've got to get it into heavy rotation on MTV. But they treated it like it's just another radio station with a bit of flash to it. They still didn't really believe in uh, that a video could make that much difference, but. I think as, you know, certain bands just exploded, you know, like Duran Duran and things because of their image, because of their look. And uh, it became obvious soon that there was a big divide between those who could create an image that was um, in, you know, uh, could could attract uh, an audience and those that couldn't. I mean, MTV in the early days in America didn't play videos of black artists. Um, and its excuse was that it was playing to the Midwest and it was playing more sort of rock-based um, music. And I think later on they acknowledged that, but they went um, and they they changed a bit. But you you had to do, or you were offered a video with Eddie Grant. So at that era of doing a video with Eddie Grant, you wouldn't have known if there was really an opportunity of that getting played. So the, that would have been taking on a job that may have had no success. So how did you go about that? And, and how did that change happen that MTV started to play videos from black artists? 
Um, I don't, I mean, I, I'm not uh, necessarily an accurate historian on that, but I think, um, I feel that Billie Jean was the, the big bridge into, into mainstream MTV. Um, because Billie Jean at first, it happened very quickly, really within the first few months of uh, the life of MTV, and Billie Jean uh, was, a, was a video, a pop video in, in CBS's records mind that will be very well received and uh, was a, uh, you know, felt, felt like, of course it's going to be played. And, and when MTV said no to that as well as what it had said no to before, which was, you know, with the excuse, as you say, of, of channeling, um, you know, more um, mainstream and, uh, pro, 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 uh, you know, something the Midwest would like to see. Um, but when when they finally broke that down, because I, that stayed as a stalemate for a few weeks only, and then they said, OK, we'll play it. And then within, you know, no time at all, Michael Jackson, within a few months, really, and, and the rest of the releases on Thriller um, became MTV. He became bigger than M anything MTV had uh, tried to take on, you know. And uh, so, you know, it was it was only a, a short time. But when we were doing the Eddie Grant video, I can't remember if that was was that pre Billy Jean. Um, I think it might yeah, it have been. was pre Billy Jean. Yeah. So that was that was well, just before. But it was also pre yeah. Human League because the Human League came in between, um, which yeah. was the sort of video that. Uh, in a sense, uh, exploded you, got you that Billie Jean job. Um, and the Human League obviously is a band. So how difficult it, was it back then, or is it, to make a video for a band that doesn't necessarily... I mean, they had a lead figure, Phil Oakey, obviously, but at the same time, it's a band and they wanted to be seen as a band. So was that a different process for you to make that video? They were... There was a number of videos that there were there were a little political like that there was this slight resentment towards it it you know the, the video seemed to play the person singing the song and leaving everyone else as a supporting act and the, yet the band often uh you know were, were much more collaborative and even sharing uh in their in their writing and their studio recording and everything and uh so I think there was a natural amount of resentment towards the lead singer, um, unless unless they were a band that were comfortable in their own skins and they just knew where where it, they stood. But um, often we'd get that brief from the record company, and only that brief is like, kind of, can we we need to share a bit with the band because they didn't want the politics of kind of band saying we don't we want we want those shots put in afterwards because you could usually guess that you're cutting to someone once too much once too many times so yeah there was there was politics and and what i tried to do with with the this, the idea for for uh, don't you want me was was do a, a film idea where there were there was relationships going on uh, the song was suggesting that as well and there were relationships um on camera and off camera and behind the scenes and within the film and uh, the film within the film and uh, it uh it, so it suited it really. I mean, you don't know what I don't think you know what the hell's going on. I used to know. I yeah, I did a whole um, backstory to it, and I used to know what that video is all about. But it's obviously very heavily influenced by Truffaut, French cinema, day for night. I I wasn't a real cinema aficionado, but I saw that film by chance one night late on Channel Four. Fell in love with Jacqueline Bisset, and was loved the idea of a film that showed the workings of filmmaking because that was also my passion and how I'd grown up was on the set with as a clapper loader so here the crew were very involved in in the film and and at some points in that film I didn't know whether we were watching which film we were watching and that was I, very exciting so I thought we'd try and do that in uh, Don't You Want Me and use all the members of the band uh, as as the players within those relationships i mean you mentioned francois truffaut and uh, and the film that inspired it but truffaut also he appeared in that film he did sort of his, his hitchcockian little appearance I, I was going through that video today to try and find you <laughs> and 
And well, there's one point of someone coming through a door near the end. And the trouble is, it's so small. I couldn't work out if it's you or not. Are you in that? You know what? I can't remember. Um, I remember that I wanted to go that one stage further, like we were trying to do with every video at the time. It was like, okay, we got this idea. It's a good idea. It works. How can we push it even further? And, and the film within a film idea was good for that song and was working. And I thought at the end, we've got to make it a three-way thing. Even the cutting room is a set. So, you know, the, the, is if we go film within a film, we're within a film, we turn on the mirror, we see us, we're the final layer. And I think it was a real rushed moment. I seem to remember we did it very last minute and it probably, I, I might be there, I can't remember, but I know the cameraman that we use and probably the focus pull and the grip were in that mirror. I don't know whether I was. I can't remember. <laughs> I mean, you say that uh, you, you always wanted to go one step further. Are you a person that uh, is ultimately, well, I don't know if it's the right word, but bored with what they've done and before and they want to, they want to sort of in, in, improve or just take that in a new direction? I don't know if the word is boredom from something, but you know what I mean? It's something that you, you have a need to develop is this is this been your life in a sense that the need to keep developing and changing and 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 have new input and output it was more i it was more i was learning that when i pushed myself i could do often do better and do things that were stronger and when i really worked hard at them and really applied to them I could do it but I was often you know you, I, could, I could be quite lazy as well and I'd be like that's a good idea let's do it and when when I did that's a good idea let's make it better it often got better and I was just learning that really at that at that time so I suppose it was it was yeah just really um becoming aware of of what you could do I mean I was excited by sometimes I was surprised by ideas I didn't know where they came from because uh, I, I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't go to art school or anything, so I didn't know, you know, what I, you, you didn't know what would come out of a blank page, and often, you know, total rubbish would come out of a blank page. But okay, but you know, luckily, occasionally, some some ideas that I really am proud of, and uh, felt that they, uh, they, I had no idea where they came from. I mean, Michael Jackson's Billie Jean is really one of the greatest videos ever made of the greatest, one of the greatest songs ever made. I mean, you know, just a fantastic and that, you know, that album was his pinnacle and that that video is absolutely incredible. What was the brief um, for the video and what was Jackson's input? Uh, the brief was, came through the manager and through... Um, the producer we had, Simon Fields, uh, and uh, it was really that he wanted, he'd seen um, Don't You Want Me uh, as one of the earliest videos on MTV. I think he'd watched the birth, the beginning of MTV, saw Don't You Want Me, and he liked it because unlike the other videos, it looked more cinematic. It looked more like a piece of cinema. It felt, we, we shot it on 35 mil, and uh, that was my whole thing was let's make it really about cinema and be cinematic. And uh, he, he really liked that. So he wanted Billie Jean to be cinematic. He felt it was a cinematic soundtrack and he wanted it to be magical in some way. So a little unreal. And uh, the manager said, look, he's really into Peter Pan, that sort of thing. Um, can it be, uh, you know, a magical story? And, and, uh, um, there was this idea that I had. I used to do brainstorming with Danny Kleiman, who became a big music video director and commercial director and everything. And uh, we, uh, he, we we kind of brainstormed an idea to do the Midas Touch for a Joan Oma trading video about maybe five months earlier. And I still had that idea, and it didn't work for her. It wasn't right for, for that song. And uh, it was stuck in my head. And so for this song, it felt like, if you, you know, this this is a sort of magical character. He is, in a lot of ways, already a sort of a, a magical character that uh, that uh, is kind of slightly off human in a way. He's got kind of, it's like a cat. He's like, you know, he moves like, uh, not like most humans move. And uh, so it felt like um, 
do something like that where the Midas touch, where everything, this character comes near, lights up. And also, um, you know, I, when I spoke to him, um, you know, he said, I asked him, I asked him, where, where does it come from? And he said, I just read it in a newspaper, you know, about this character, Billy Jean. And uh, he'd say he'd, it was a story in a newspaper. So it became about the newspaper as well. He didn't really, um, it, there weren't any I, ideas as such that he put into it. When I got to LA, uh, we'd written and faxed the script, they'd approved the budget and they'd, they'd we wanted to go ahead. But the first thing I did when I got to LA was sit down with him and show him a storyboard of uh, how it would all come together, the uh, the video and, and the frames that we'd be using in the various places. And uh, he was he, he just took it all in and just um, enjoyed how it would be. And uh, and then he did suggest another scene, which was a great, I thought was a great idea, which was a dancing scene where um, these characters came alive, but they were instead of lit up, they were they were mannequins that came alive and they danced behind him down the street, which I thought was a fantastic idea. And he said, we can get choreography. And I said, that'd be amazing. But when we went to the record company with that idea uh, and the cost implication of that idea, which was only $5,000, I remember, um, which was spend the time, um, they said, no, we, we, you're getting $50,000 to do this video. Well, you're not getting a penny more. That's it. And we couldn't absorb that because actually we weren't making any markup on it anyway. So we couldn't absorb it. So we couldn't do the idea. So I presume that they would tell Michael this. But I think to this day, he thinks I kiboshed the idea. But, um, uh, you know, obviously he's not with us anymore. But I, I, I saw an interview with him where he, he felt that... Uh, I'd not let him dance, which which I, I was staggered by because I had a, in the storyboards we did, you know, I'd been told that he danced and he practiced a dance in front of the mirror. So we'd left two choruses for him to dance of a clearly storyboarded with him, dance, you know, didn't know how to depict him dancing, but they were proper choruses, long chapters of it. So, but I think it was because the record company cleverly swerved the extra money by you blaming me possibly for not wanting to do something that was going to cost extra money, you know? Um, so, but who knows, you know, I don't know the, the full story of that. Um, but uh, there was a funny phone call from him the night before we shot where he rang up and I was in the Chateau Marmont and I was rang in the hotel and he was like, Steve, can, you know what? Let's not do the, uh, let's not do the, the dancing. And, and I had already gone. We we weren't doing it because we had didn't have the money to do it. And uh, I I said okay. And I I could have said you're not doing it because we we weren't given we weren't allowed to do it. Um, but uh, anyway, we left it at that. And I presume that then they would sort of come and said okay, do the dancing on beat it, do it on the next, do it on do it from here, leave the video how it is, you know. Well, one thing that I find really fascinating about that video, it sort of references to me, um, and I don't know if that's true, other, you remember the Jacksons, Can You Feel It, where they're almost gods and they're, you know, you mentioned the Midas touch, but they're throwing down gold dust over the world. And they're, they're sort of demigods or something in, in this video, yeah. which, which Michael was in as well. And also Saturday Night Fever, when John Travolta dances on the lit up dance floor, but different, he's not in charge of the dance floor. Whereas Michael was in charge of, you know, the 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 lit dance floor that you'd created um, yeah. for Billy Jean. Were they were they reference points for you? Or is that just coincidence? I think that's more coincidence. That uh, the Saturday Night Fever, I don't remember being um, in the thinking at all. Um, the gold dust on the videos. Uh, maybe, maybe some of that sunk in you know, watching it, but I'm not sure. I felt it was, we were trying to do something that hadn't, you hadn't really seen before. And uh, that was, so this, the paving stones, I didn't really reference over anything. They were just kind of, you know, this, this is uh, just a piece of magic that I hadn't really seen as far as I could remember. Um, 
but yeah, you're right. There's Saturday Night Fever, of course. In fact, we did the Adam and the Ants video, the Ant music video, and that was more Saturday Night Fever. That was Adam Ant saying, look, I, I want to do that thing in Saturday Night Fever when, you know, you got the only, and it was the only underlit dance floor in London at the time. Can't remember the name of the club, but yeah, we managed to get it and shoot it there. Yeah, I think I went to that club. It was a gay club. <laughs> in the, in the yes. Yeah, right. no, I can't remember yeah. what it's called. And it had some really tacky name. I forgot what yeah. it's called. But I remember loving dancing on that dance floor after Saturday Night yeah. Um But one thing that I think really comes out in both the Jackson video and um, Madonna's Burning Up, which you did, is the um, their star quality, if I can call it that, where the... When Jackson looks at the camera, when he dances and he looks at the camera in Billie Jean, I mean, there is this amazing connection that you get with him. And when Madonna's, you know, writhing, I think it's, is it on a bridge? And when she's, you know, sort of crawling around on the bridge or whatever and looking at the camera, you get exactly, you get that as well. What do you think these really phenomenal, successful pop stars have that others don't? Um stardust quality i mean it's like a it's very hard to put your finger on it but you do see it i mean you kind of when i met madonna i felt it was there when i'm obviously when i saw michael in particular on that in that studio doing doing his his thing uh you just have this this otherworldly star david bowie as well you know that that uh, um that that isn't and mere mortals don't really have it's very hard to describe it and you it's kind of a feeling and i suppose you you know you know them already because you've known them on on tv lit and uh but uh often you know you meet you meet people and they're they're not quite what they were on television actors everything and uh but with uh, certain certain people like madonna and and uh Michael Jackson, they they were on or off the camera there. They were built to be stars. I mean, another staple of MTV was Take On Me, which is also a phenomenal video with this animation aspect at the start. And at the end, it's creating the sex symbol out of Morton Harkett, in a sense, that he breaks through the glass, the animation figure breaks through the glass, and suddenly there he is in all his sweating, beautiful glory, as it were. And you've, you've created... Uh, a sex symbol was was he comfortable with doing that because i've i've met him a few times interviewed him a few times and went around his house and i always felt that he poo-pooed the aspect of his looks because he wanted also to be taken seriously and as a band they're really taken seriously today but at that point they they were more of a sort of pop throwaway band um so was that something that came into the discussion with take on me no, because it was too early, really. He didn't really know. He hadn't become that sex symbol yet. Um, it wasn't until after the video, really, that he uh, that, that it all hit and went crazy for him, like a teen idol. And uh, that messed with anybody's head. But that hadn't happened yet. So, you know, we were when we were shooting the video, we were just doing a video. So he wasn't relating that to being a sex symbol because he didn't he he didn't know, and he was quite young and a bit naive in a way about it felt like about girls I don't think it had a real relationship at that point um with a with a with a girl and uh, I mean I'm you know I'm sure he wasn't a virgin but um you know he, he didn't feel like he he that was necessarily something that, that was at the front of his mind he he just actually um would uh would be happy to you know, to belt out that song and do it for real, and you know, even miming to it, he wanted to do. He wanted to show that this is this is what he could do. That's what he was proud of. Was was being a singer, and uh, that uh, you know, the sex symbol thing then hit on a, such a like a big tidal wave. Thousands of screaming girls and front covers of all these magazines, and then it was a big question of like, this is this. This isn't what I was putting out there. This is not what I meant it to be, and or ever thought it could become. But it came with the uh, with the territory. 
Yeah, I think it's amazing. I think that's that's you know one of the the, the great power of the pop video was that it could create a star from how they were presented in a in a video. And I think Aha really showed that with Dire Straits. Maybe it's a sort of different story because MTV. What I heard. And, and Money for Nothing launched MTV Europe, obviously, but it was made before. But what I heard was that MTV America were not happy with the original footage or Dire Straits wanted like a live video and MTV America wanted something else added to it. And I presume that's why you were brought in and then the mm -hmm. whole thing changed. So could you tell me about that? Yeah, it was... Um... It was it was pretty straightforward. I mean, Jeff Aroff at, at, um, at Warner's just said that Mark's not very keen on videos, but he's written a song which is a little, in a way, condemnation of MTV and uh, and videos. But it uh, it is something that he doesn't really appreciate. He thinks that the you know people are listening to the song. It should be pure. It should be about the band playing it. It should be uh, if if you have to see it on TV. But the the thing that we don't want to do is put images this was you know dire straits felt like they didn't want to put images to in any way change the meaning of the purity of, of the meaning of the song and naturally you're going to put images to it if they're not coming from exactly the same place then they're not purely uh, what the intentions were and can slightly color the uh, the the experience of listening to the song I mean, what was interesting about that song in itself was that it was derogatory to MTV. The yeah. actual lyrics are derogatory to MTV. So, you know, money for nothing and the chicks are free. And yet MTV took it and made it uh, an MTV song and sort of turned it round in a sense with the line, I want my MTV. And I, I find that really sort of uh, amazing because it's it goes from one aspect of them not initially being keen you making a video that is then compatible for the band and works for MTV, and then MTV taking it completely on board as a sort of positive <laughs> uh, work for MTV. Was, was that something that you were aware of at the time? Yeah, I, I, straight away you listen to those lyrics, you're like, uh, they, they, would, they really want to promote this, yeah? Um, <laughs> and uh, they're like, yes, we do. And, and they were right, you know, because they could say... They, by by not saying we're not playing that because that's against us um you know they made it for them they made it like it's like fine that's these are opinions that we can all have and uh, um and you know and it's fun and uh, it was kind of you know we were exploring new territory with the with the cgi animation and so it was very it was very like it felt like part of mtv that they they their identity very much came from which was quite clever early on these little interstitial videos short little five ten second cuts of claymation or whatever that with the mtv logo and they were they were very clever because they they gave they rose mtv as as the ceiling to everything as the, it gave it you know it kept the identity even though some of these bands were massive and and iconic and it still you know they surrounded it with this this uh, roof of uh, mtv so anything you know, they could get away with anything even a derogatory song going to number one and giving it mtv video of the year as well <laughs> it's like um all of it was uh was was kind of funny and ironic for me um and uh and you know i i got to know mark quite well after that and uh we did a number of other videos and it was it yeah it was uh it was something that just kind of came at the right time because it was a time when people were questioning mtv it was like what was it four years old or something and uh, is it still relevant is it is it you know is it gonna what's it gonna do next what's coming and this came along so that was that year sorted one of the things that you as an early video director you became a film director and and also a series director what for you is you know film is very collaborative and I presume series is also incredibly collaborative and there's much more uh money in terms of budget um and many more people that are involved in decision making 
was there more freedom making videos or is there more freedom for you today when you make a series or you make a film? Definitely more freedom with videos. I had uh, a period where a few years where, um, you know, it was literally I could do whatever I, within reason, obviously, but whatever I wanted to do and, you know, with good budgets and things, it was, uh, I was uh, trusted with that because of, we'd had success with some of it and, um that that was freedom i never really got again although i did some mini series uh later arabian nights and after merlin was a, a quite a big hit uh hallmark entertainment gave me some sort of blank pages in the same way they said what do you want to do i said arabian nights let's do arabian nights uh and they you know they came up with 26 million dollars to make it and really i had no uh yeah, no, no interference or really was allowed to do what I wanted to do. For a few of those miniseries, it, it became a bit like a video where it was like, right, put your, do what you want, do it how you want. And that was great fun, obviously. I'm a writer and obviously my voice is in what I write. As a director, what do you look for in a script and how do you then manage to put yourself <laughs> into the voice of who's ever written it. So you're actually confined yourself within the script. Uh, I think just understanding where the script's coming from, uh, under, making sure you're getting the subtext uh, and, and get everything you can from the writer um, in terms of intentions and whys and wheres. And, uh, and then, uh, and then, I'm going to naturally have ideas and some of them are slightly different. Some of them take it in a slightly different way, but uh, you know, you, you, they expect that. Um, and I think writers are, are grateful that you're trying to, to not take away from it, but just to, to embellish and add to what the idea and what the, what tells the story the best way. Um, so it's uh it's a good, usually a good project. I just worked with Ashley, um, Ashley Farrow. Just worked with Ashley Farrow on uh, Around the World in Eighty Days, and uh, one, you know, great experience because he all he wants to do is make it as as good as possible, and and uh, enjoys where you take it when you take it on, and ju jumps back in and and ca helps carry the 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 load. One thing about the eighties. For me, if I go back to that decade to finish with, one thing about the 80s for me is that it wasn't always a great decade. It was a decade of sexism, racism, misogyny, homophobia, unemployment. You know, there, was, there were lots of societal things which were bad in that decade. Yet it had this escapism of music and also uh, music video. Do you think music video played a role in changing societal values, I like to think so. I mean, it be it was the you know a large part of pop culture at the time, and pop culture uh, was influencing people. It was seen to be influencing the rhythm of the the eighties. You know, it got things got faster somehow from the seventies. It it got quicker. Consumption a little bit got quicker, but thinking got quicker and action got a bit quicker. Did it bring the Berlin Wall down? I, I'd love to think so. I'd love to think it helped uh, the peoples, uh, gave them, you know, a braver outlet to, to come and uh, smash the wall down and, and uh, you know, break through and break out. Um, but I don't know. That's for historians, I suppose, to ponder over if they even go there. <laughs> Well, I, I think it did as well. And I just want to say you were a massive part of that, a massive part of my um, 20s, uh, which was during the 80s uh, with these music videos and also someone who worked for MTV. And uh, yeah, you're still here today. You're still making great series and uh, films. And I really appreciate your creative in input into our world. So Steve Barron, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Steve Blaine. Thank you. Up there is an interview I recommend. Down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews. And here is where you can connect. <laughs>